Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Purple Insider. Matthew Collar here. And joining me on the show is Aaron McMahon. He is a Michigan football beat reporter for MLive.com. You know, Aaron, we have been talking pretty much nonstop about J.J. McCarthy, but you had a chance to cover J.J. McCarthy's entire time at Michigan. So let me start out with this question. Did you expect to hear that the Minnesota Vikings could potentially trade up into the top five to draft J.J. McCarthy. Was that something that you expected after the national championship? Probably not, um, but I, I guess nothing surprises me at this point. Uh, you know, when he initially declared at the end of, or beginning of January after Michigan won the national championship, I, I think the assumption at that point was he was – kind of looked at it as like a fringe first-round pick. I, I think the assumption was he was going to go first round just because he played at Michigan and they won a national championship and he had all that success. But we've seen him gradually move up the board now in the last the last couple of months. I think part of that has been you know the need for a quarterback. Um, I, I think a lot of NFL talent evaluators have turned on the film and realized, wow, J.J. may maybe a little bit better than we thought, than maybe the numbers show. Um, so you, you see him make this, this rise. He's gone from like, borderline first round to middle of the first round and now we're hearing his name it seems like over and over in the top 10 and, and now we're hearing top five so no I'm not shocked um you know the, t- the teams are always you know uh, uh, you know uh, you know it could be any team right like any a lot of several teams looking for quarterbacks you don't know which one necessarily wants to move up and get him but um to, no I mean his ceiling is so high uh and, and we'll probably get into that in a minute but no the, the kid the kid is talented Um, There's no doubt about it. He played winning football. So like from an NFL perspective, I I get why teams are interested. Well, I want to go back to kind of the whole story of him at Michigan. You know, he comes in and becomes a bit of a game manager type for last year and sort of shows that there's something there. And throughout this last season, uh, then he's taking this great team to win after win after win, but they're not really leaning on him. They're leaning much more on Blake Corum in the running game. And you talk about that ceiling. I guess I wonder when he came in, he was highly recruited, the IMG thing, all that. Uh, talk about the growth that you saw from him from kind of the time that he got there until that national championship game. Yeah, you could tell when Jim Harbaugh recruited him, there was a desire right away. Like He, he loved the kid. He kind of saw, I think, a lot of himself in J.J. McCarthy. Um, and he gravitated toward him pretty quickly. You know, Jim was known not to play freshman uh, quarterbacks much, and it, it certainly didn't start, and it was rare if they saw the field. Uh, J.J.'s freshman year, you know, he was kind of played this, like, ancillary backup position where they throw him in casually in games and certain packages and certain situations. I think just to get his feet wet and see what they had out of him. Um, you know, he had a moment early in his freshman year in, in a non-conference game. At, I think it was Western Michigan, one of the first few games where he had this across the field throw that went for like 70 yards and a touchdown. And I think right away fans got excited because they heard about him in, in high school and the arm strength and the talent and everything else. But Jim kind of waited a year. You know, he had Cade McNamara, who kind of came out of nowhere to win the starting job in, in, in the 2021. Uh, and they're winning with him. So there's necessarily no need to kind of throw J.J. into the fire right away. But they did a good job bringing him along. As I said, they used him occasionally in 21. He eventually won the starting job in 2022. And it, it was kind of, uh, you know, growth from there. Um, he's got a really good arm. Um, you can tell he's a winner. I mean, everywhere he's been, he won a state title in Illinois. He went down to IMG Academy, the football factory in Florida, and won there. Um, so he's been surrounded by good players, and, and, and he's used to winning. And I think that's the difference between him and maybe some of these other quarterbacks that are considered high-level level prospects. So uh, from a girl's perspective, I, I think you saw much of it at Michigan. Yes, they didn't throw the ball a ton. I mean, this past year, I think they're running the, running the ball at a 60% clip, which is the top 10 in the country. So they didn't necessarily didn't lean on him a ton. But when you look at his numbers, I mean, he was arguably one of the more productive and efficient quarterbacks in the country. You know, completion percentage above 70%, quarterback rating that was extremely high. When they leaned on him and they had to use him, he came through. And, and they think that was a difference with, with Michigan's offense. Well, and that's the thing that we're talking about so much is that quarterbacks with lower uses versus someone like Michael Penix and Penix is much older than JJ McCarthy. So some of it is trying to project in a system for the Minnesota Vikings, where you'd be talking about throwing the ball five or 600 times where he's never really had to do that. 
And I that, think that's what makes him a little bit of a hard projection for me. But it seems like every time he's discussed, that personality and character is the, the first thing that comes up. So I read all the draft analysts and their takes on it from insiders, but you've had a chance to cover him. I, I want to understand what this character and personality is better that makes him such an attractive prospect. Yeah, he's a unique guy. I, you know, everyone I think assumes he's this like rah rah leader type guy, and he's not really that. You have to remember he wasn't he wasn't voted captain by his team this past year in Michigan. Then with some other guys, but he's kind of a you know show it on the field type type guy where um, you know he's he he stays after practice and works extra. He'll he has no problem working with the receivers and, and the running backs to develop continuity. Um, he, he's definitely a team first guy. You really saw that during his time at Michigan because. You know, the last couple of years, I can't tell you how many times he got asked questions. Well, you know, do you wish you'd throw the ball? You know, is this offense suitable for you? Do you wish you were in a more, you know, high octane offense? And his response every time was, I'm just trying to win football games for the team. Uh, so I, I think he'll be up wherever he lands, whether it's Minnesota, whether it's somewhere else. I think he's going to be a great locker room fit. He's not going to be an issue. Um, the kid, the kids, as nice as they come. You know, I've been covering the team now for seven plus years, and I can't think of a nicer kid that I've covered. And I genuinely mean that. He, he has a tough time, and it's almost a negative toward him. He has a tough time saying no to people. Every interview that he that was asked of him, he would do in college. Every opportunity, every business, it seemed like every business deal. Um, he would say yes to. Uh, he's a he's a people pleaser. That's who J.J. McCarthy is. Um, he's he's a great locker room guy. People gravitate toward him. I remember going to a, a summer camp last year with one of his Michigan teammates. One of his teammates actually hosted the camp in his hometown. He was a center of attention. And J.J. ended up being the more pop, popular kid at the camp. The kids gravitated toward him. They rushed toward him. They, they loved him. That's just kind of who he is. He can be a face of franchise, and, and I think he'd do a great, great job of it. Um, but he's a little different leader. He's not that locker room going to sit up and give a speech and, and everything else. That's not him. He's more do it, um, you know, do it on the field. Okay, what's with the pregame warm-up stuff? Is he a strange guy? Because I think about like Will Levis and how he put mayo in his coffee, and that was a big red flag. I'm mostly kidding, but I am curious about that in particular because every single game would make a big deal out of here. He's putting below the goalposts and all that. Like what do, what do we know about that? Yeah, so he got the meditating thing under the goalpost pregame from one of Michigan's former punters, Brad Robbins. So I, I think he just started doing it a few years ago, but it's certainly become a regular part of his routine. He says it helps calm him down and kind of you know allows him to kind of get get motivated for the game. Uh, he can be an eccentric guy. You know, there's one time this past season, right before the Penn State game, uh, I was, you know, at the football building in Ann Arbor waiting for the team to depart for the, the airport. And the buses were pulled up next to the building, and most of the team had, had boarded the buses. The coaches were there. They couldn't find McCarthy. He was kind of by himself on the practice uh, practice field, I guess, meditating on his own. So he can be a little, a little eccentric. Um, it, it's worked for him. Uh, no, certainly, no one's complained about it. They've kind of let him do his thing, and obviously, it's 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 amounted to some success. I think that every single one of these guys is weird. Like if you become a really good anything, but especially quarterback, they all have odd quirky things. And Kirk Cousins, who, you know, obviously we covered for a long time here, had a lot of eccentricities to himself as well. And I think probably every uh, quarterback does. But that was that became kind of obnoxious from the broadcast every single time. Like we're going to focus it on him. And can we let him meditate? Do we have to have the cameras like circling around him? So I guess if he could focus through that. Uh, when you talked about his ceiling, though, this is the most intriguing part to the Minnesota Vikings, because when you watch him back, which I have done more than I thought that I would going into uh, this draft season, but you see, uh, you mentioned the arm strength, but you also see some inconsistency in that at times, and you see mobility and playmaking at times. And then there are other times where you're like, hey, buddy, you could probably outrun some people like go ahead and take off. Uh, how far in your mind does he have to go to reach that ceiling from where he was last year? I, I think it comes comes with probably throwing the ball more and being put more in those pressure situations. You got to remember that the last, really, the last couple of years, you know, Michigan won a lot of football games. Uh, you know, they they weren't really in in many close games to begin with, so he wasn't under a ton of pressure. And when he did make mistakes. 
Um, the, the one game that comes to mind right away is a, is a TCU game in the semifinal a couple of years ago. That he was under pressure. I mean, like physically and, and literally too. I mean, it was, it was one of those situations where you weren't used to being in a tight game. You were on the you know, on the big stage, and you throw a couple of pick sixes, and people are scratching heads, wondering, you know, what type of quarterback are you? You know, and, and so I think he learned from it a little bit. Um, the one the one negative with JJ is when he does make a mistake, they tend to compile. Uh, we saw that even this this season against Bowling Green, non-conference game, Michigan's, you know, projected to win, favored to win, and they ended up winning big. But he threw three picks, and he admitted afterwards he was forcing things. He had this stat in his mind; he wanted to have more touchdown passes and incompletions at that point. It was this wild thing. So he he kind of gets hyper focused on certain things. I think that needs to be taken away, and I think he needs to maybe maybe um, you know be a little. Um, you know, less let less pressure, and he's talked about that a lot. You know, he faces a lot of pressure. I think that goes with the territory of being a quarterback and everything else. But I think if he's put in a system, he's able to get a rhythm, and he has he has playmakers around him. I, th- I think that's going to help. And the one thing a lot of folks are, don't talk about really at Michigan, you know, during his time is maybe the lack of elite receivers that that he had. I mean, good quarterbacks can you know make can make themselves but receivers help too Michigan didn't have a ton of that they had Roman Wilson this year but there wasn't no elite guy that can go up and get the football or you know like Caleb Williams had it at USC or Michael Penix had it at Washington guys can go up and get the football and, and, and you know create something so he had to do a lot of that on his own in a way so um yeah I'm curious to see what he looks like at the NFL level surrounded by elite talent like at Minnesota they got some some great receivers and I think that would certainly help his his case um, but it, it's going to, I think it's going to be a learning process. You know, it's probably going to take him a year or two to get used to the NFL style playbook and everything else. But, you know, he's got the intangibles. It's something Jim Harbaugh harped on. And obviously it makes sense because he's a head coach and he wants to push his guy and everything else. But, um, you got to remember Harbaugh is an NFL quarterback. He knows good quarterbacks when he sees them. And, you know, of, of the seven years I covered this Michigan football team, um, there was never a quarterback more, more talked about from, from Harbaugh's standpoint than, than JJ McCarthy. Do you think that if he didn't win the national championship and he had played for a regular program that went like 10 and two or something that he would have not come out in the draft. And then by next year, he would have thrown 500 passes and had 40 touchdowns and 10 interceptions. This is the thing that I struggle with the most is it's hard to unsee the production that's right in front of you rather than having to imagine the production that would have happened. But as you mentioned, if they had leaned on him in the following season, it would have been his offense. Then his statistics probably would have been quite a bit different. So in your mind, should, if the Vikings draft him, should they play Sam Darnold for the majority, if not the entire next season and try to develop JJ McCarthy, even as difficult as that can be when you draft a quarterback high? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I it wouldn't. It would not surprise me. I think it would probably do him some good putting him on the bench for a year, letting him learn the ways. You know, Darnold's obviously an experienced vet. They could probably help him uh, along. That would make sense to me. I mean, I'm not obviously in the, in the minds of the, the the GM there in Minnesota, but I got to think it's a possibility. Um, and to your, to your point about him playing in more of a high octane offense, I'll go a step further. If he had played in you know, that, that Washington offense or in Oregon with some of those receivers or USC, I do think he would have put up, fan, you know, incredible numbers. His, his passing yards would have obviously probably been near the top. He would have thrown for a bit more touchdowns. It, it just it just makes sense, right? I think he has the arm ability and, and the ability to place the ball in the tight windows that some of these other quarterbacks don't necessarily have on a more regular basis. So I, I do think so. And it was just – I think his lack of production or lack of numbers is was a direct result of the offense he played in. But, I, I, you know, J.J., I do think a year would do him some good sitting, just sitting and watching and, and kind of absorbing everything. Um, you know, that's what he did at Michigan, and I think it helped him, and I think it would, it would help at the NFL level too. I think so too. It's just one of those things where when you draft someone, if you trade up to the fifth overall pick or something, and then the owner, right, away, right? Yeah. Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, you get maybe your four and six at some point and Sam Darnold's not playing that well. And everyone's to see the kids. See the, I mean, last year they even ended up playing Jaron Hall a little bit because they got frustrated with Josh Dobbs and uh, Nick Mullins. Uh, I would do want to ask you about Jim Harbaugh and his coaching style there because I think that this does play into McCarthy and the numbers and that whole discussion because Jim Harbaugh is from the nineties. And I respect the fact that he would have handed the ball off to Marshall Falk a hundred times when he was playing, I guess was Marshall Falk playing with him. Maybe he was, Uh, but you know what I mean? Like that's how they ran offense. Then 
McCarthy playing under center uh, would have mattered to me because he's going to do that in the NFL. Um, but I wonder like how much was not wanting to lean on McCarthy? How much was Jim Harbaugh being kind of old school? How much was the fact that the running back was good and it was just the way to win? Like how, how do we weigh all of these different factors with the way that Harbaugh wanted to play football? Yeah, it's important to point out, Jim basically played the same style of offense the entire time in his time at Michigan. They, they, they gravitated more towards a West Coast style passing game for a year or two before J.J. got there, and they, they noticed it didn't really work out. Part of it was, I, I think, the play calling, and I think part of it was just the personnel they have didn't fit the offense. But once J.J. got here, I, I think the assumption was they were going to open it up a little bit more. Everyone saw his arm and his playmaking ability, and they, they kind of went the opposite way. Uh, part of that was I, I, their inability to beat Ohio State at that point and to kind of get over the hump to get in the Big Ten Championship. So I, I think they realized that they, they couldn't beat Ohio State throwing the ball, so they had to kind of go the, the totally opposite direction. And, and Michigan's largely recruited offensive linemen very well. They've had some under-the-radar running backs in the past. They've always you know made an attempt to, to recruit tight ends. So I think they made the decision to kind of that – that was how the offense was going to operate. Whether whether JJ McCarthy was at quarterback or someone else was there, the, the strength was going to be, up, you know, in, in the trenches up front with the running backs and the offensive line. And they had so much success doing it in 2021 with with Cade McNamara as a starter and not JJ McCarthy. I, I think they realized that was the way to go. Uh, and as I said earlier, JJ seemed on board with it all. You know, he there was never one period, never one time where. We heard rumors about him deciding, you know, considering a transfer or wanting to go elsewhere. He got on board with it, and it worked. Um, you know, he made the most of it when he did throw the football. Um, but that was kind of, you know, they had a couple of good running backs, Hassan Haskins, and then obviously Blake Corm the last couple of years. But um, they made the decision to, to kind of lean on it, and that's how it worked. Um, you know, it's important to point out Jim necessarily wasn't the guy calling the plays, but the offense was certainly modeled in his vision of what he wanted. And that's how they rolled. Um, that's how they won. That's how they kind of flipped the script, I guess, in the Big Ten. Because for so long, the narrative was Michigan, you know, couldn't couldn't beat Ohio State. They couldn't get over the hump and, and get in the Big Ten championship game. And and eventually, you know, they went well. You know, Ohio State zigged. They kind of zagged, and and it worked. Yeah, in uh, connection with the whole offense and McCarthy and so forth, it just seems like coachable is the word that keeps coming up and somebody who is going to follow what his coach tells them they need to do to win, which could be very important with Kevin O'Connell because this relationship between a former quarterback head coach and the quarterback and those guys building an offense together is going to be really vital to whether this pick succeeds or not. Do you think that Jim Harbaugh was actually close to becoming the Vikings head coach, or was that more of just our friend John U. Bacon, who we all became aware of, uh, putting out stuff for Harbaugh? Like, did, do you think that it actually came close? I, I do. There was desire at that point that Jim wanted to go back to the NFL, uh, and he admitted afterward. Admitted that afterwards. You know, there was a there's always been a burning desire to go back. Uh, he got so close to winning a Super Bowl and almost beating his brother in Sanford with San, when he was the head coach of the, the 49ers that um, there was. Uh, and I think part of it too is the the inability up to that point, as I was talking about, getting over the hump. You know, remember, you know, he went and it was 2021, and you know they're coming off a, a, a Big Ten title. Finally, they finally had you know. A, a successful, like really good season, and and people were calling. Um, I don't know. I don't know how close he was was to getting that Minnesota job. They he obviously was being seriously considered. He flew out there and, and interviewed with Quasi. Uh, you know, from my understanding, they still have a good relationship. You know, Quasi was on the sidelines um, of, of the Michigan Minnesota game this past year in Minneapolis, and I, I saw him firsthand. He was having conversations with Jim, and they still have a friendly relationship to this day. So I, I have to think too, Jim lobbying for JJ. Um, whether, you know, him coming out a few months ago and saying he should be the number one quarterback off the board or, you know, he's the best quarterback all, all time at Michigan. Um, I think that does resonate with folks. And if in relationship with Quasi probably helps. So I have to think that could be one of the reasons why the Vikings have, you know, certainly seriously considering drafting uh, J.J. McCarthy. Well, and also could be maybe trading up to number five in order to do so. That has always made even a little more sense to me than Arizona because Arizona needs uh, great players for Kyler Murray. And I think uh, Los Angeles needs all of the players. Uh, how do you think he's going to do in his return to the NFL? It seems like he took over a team with a quarterback and, and not a whole heck of a lot else. I think it's going to take a couple of years for uh, Jimmy to put his touch on things. 
Yeah, it probably will. Uh, the one thing that Jim has shown, whether it's in the college level or the pro level, is the guy knows how to win. I mean, he, he started his coaching career at University of San Diego, his FCS school, kind of no, no, no one expected him to do anything there. He, he won there. He goes to Stanford, wins there. Again, another school that isn't necessarily known for, for, for football. Uh, and then he goes to the 49ers and proves that, you know, he can he can he can put together winning teams and, and get to the, you know, the final stage. And then he finally does it at Michigan. So, yeah, I think eventually he'll be successful. It might take him a year or two. Um, but the Chargers job makes so much sense to me. I mean, he, he still has a home in Southern he still has a home in Southern California. He's familiar with the area. Um, you know, he was friendly with the Chargers ownership group. Uh, he knows what it takes to win in that level. And, and I think there's obviously a burning desire, as I was talking about earlier, to get back there. So I, I think he wants to prove, you know, there was, all, and he talked about it this year, there was always this rival, sibling rivalry with his brother, John. John got got the, you know, the, the notch on him in the Super Bowl, and he was able to finally win a college college champion, national championship. So I think the next goal for him is winning a Super Bowl. And I think he's he's determined to do anything he, he can to, to get there. So I think eventually he'll be successful. It might take a year or two, as you said. But I think the first step in, in, in finding a team to, to coach is having a good quarterback, and he certainly got that with Justin Herbert. Now it's it's on them to kind of fill, fill pieces around him and, and kind of play the, the, the style of football that Jim Harbaugh thinks – things can win out there. Yeah, that'll be very interesting to watch. And of course, there was a section of Vikings fans who desperately wanted Jim Harbaugh to be their head coach here. I think that everything ended up right for everybody with he's got his big quarterback here and the Vikings with O'Connell, I think is going to work out with them long term. Uh, Last thing for you, though, uh, Aaron, how funny is it that Detroit is hosting the draft and they don't have a high pick? For the first time in forever, like does Matt Millen make the pick? Does he come out and uh, take a wide receiver or something? What what's uh, what's that like for Detroit to actually be good when they're hosting the uh, draft there? Yeah, it's ironic, right? Because I feel like year after year the super the the draft was kind of like Detroit Super Bowl, right? There's always that hope that they could get this franchise changing player, and they rarely did, and. Uh, now that you know they're coming off their best season in a very long time, and, and now they're drafting late. Uh, you know the word is they they may decide to trade up. Uh, it also wouldn't surprise me if they traded out of that pick, if if whoever's you know not on their board is, isn't available that late. Uh, so it, it, nonetheless, it's a big deal for the city. You know Detroit is very much a sports town. They clamor for good football. They love good football. I think the nation saw that this year with some of those those lines, especially the playoff games where you know Ford Field was jammed and tickets were going for thousands of dollars and, and everything else that they, they, they want a winner. They finally got it. Uh, so I think they're willing to excuse it. I mean, as long as they can get back there and make another run next year, but that, nonetheless, downtown Detroit will be packed that weekend. I'm excited to see it. Uh, it's, you know, it, it's a long time coming uh, and a lot of fans. Nonetheless, I think we'll be eager to see who, who, the, who they take in the first round. Yeah, you can't host the draft and then trade out of the first round. Then uh, you're going to get booed there in Detroit, although it's not Philadelphia, so maybe they'd be fine with it. Uh, Aaron McMahon, great stuff, man. I really appreciate your insight into J.J. McCarthy and that system there at uh, at uh, Michigan. And also, I'm jealous that you got to cover a championship. That's something we don't get to cover as reporters in Minnesota very often. So uh, I'm, I hope you had a good time doing that. And I really appreciate your time, man. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me.